Welcome to our, uh, our Avoiding Burnout and Finding Hope Amidst uh, Crisis webinar. We are thrilled to have our, our special guest today and, uh, and have a discussion uh, about what I think is something that's very timely uh, and, and is hopefully going to be help, help a lot of people. Um, so the, we're going to follow the same format we followed in the past on these. We'll run for about an hour. We'll target uh, finishing up right on the hour, uh, an hour from now. Uh, occasionally, if the discussion is real, real, real rich, we'll go over a couple minutes, but we'll do our best to, to keep it there. Um, my name is Jason Johnson. I'm going to be kind of the, uh, the moderator for this. I represent the Y-Tri organization. Um, I'm a school psychologist, kind of oversee training, research, and development for the organization, and I'm thrilled for uh, any time I get to be part of these. Um, Today we're going to be having a discussion with, uh, we've got five special guests here, and they represent a, a pretty broad um, perspective across the world of education and mental health. And I'm really excited to see how all their ideas come together around something that I think is impacting uh, a lot of people. Um, and so let me introduce our guests here. Uh, we'll go down the line. First of all, we've got Miss Courtney Agers. Welcome, Courtney. Courtney's a seventh and eighth grade science teacher at Callaway Middle School um, in LaGrange, Georgia. She was named as the 2020 Teacher of the Year for her school, was one of the three finalists for Troop County Teacher of the Year. Nice job, Courtney. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, next, we have Miss Amanda Ball. Uh, Amanda teaches, let's see, a Currently, you are teaching seventh grade English, correct? No, I am currently teaching seventh and eighth grade reading support. I have uh, kind of got a new position this year. We are all virtual until January, and I'm doing reading support this year for seventh and eighth grade. Perfect. Thank you. Interesting background, background in nursing, switched over to education, also a mother. You've got some really great experience that you bring to the table. We're excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, next, we've got um, Joe Hendershot. Welcome, Joe. Joe's been with us before, a longtime friend of the organization, uh, sought after speaker about the effects of trauma on learning and behaviors, working with wounded students and working with wounded educators. He's the founder of Hope for the Wounded, provides consulting, staff training, online courses, author of multiple books. Um, he, and his, uh, he and his wife, Darty. Um, run a, an incredible organization that we're thrilled to, to be friends with and to be able to be collaborators with. Uh, welcome, Joe. We're thrilled to have you. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Uh, next, we got Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson, uh, he's an award-winning educator. Uh, since 2012, he's been teaching and consulting principals and teachers. Prior to that, he worked as a teacher and principal. Uh, he works with leaders throughout the United States, leads multiple innovation leadership efforts. Uh, currently located in Georgia, correct? Right. Uh -huh. um, again, his current work supporting and developing leaders as the principal of Morgan County High School in Madison, Georgia. Uh, while there, he was named the principal of the year by the NASSP. Welcome, Mark. We are thrilled to have you. And Jason, it's great to be here with you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Christian Moore, a licensed clinical social worker, uh, founder of the y -Tri organization, um, internationally uh, renowned speaker, passionate advocate for youth, and author of The Resilience Breaker, Breakthrough. And uh, Christian's been on many of these and brings an incredible uh, amount of experience and expertise on the topic of resilience, education, and mental health. So we've got a, a really nice, broad, broad uh, representation here that we're thrilled to have. So... Um, if it's all right with you, I think I'd like to jump right into it. We have some, some talking points that I think we want to get to. And what I want to start off right now, you know, we're obviously in the midst of some, some pretty incredible crisis, unlike anything I think educators and therapists have ever dealt with before. And so right now, you know, there's a lot of talk about supporting students, which is important. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But I wanted to start off the discussion with a little bit about um, what our educators and our counselors need right now. And so 
as educators, I want to throw this question first to Amanda and Courtney, um, and then after we hear from them, we can, uh, I'd love to hear from, from Joel, Mark, and Christian. But as educators, how big of a concern right now do you think burnout and compassion fatigue is? And what do you see as the things that are really contributing to it? Let's start with Courtney. Um, right now, I think it's a really big concern. Um, in the times that we're in right now, thinking about how do we um, adequately meet the needs of our students, um, making, I know, Mark, you, uh, Jason, I'm sorry, you and I were speaking earlier and we were talking about um, how I teach classes and currently right now I'm doing virtual and I'm doing tradition, traditional. So um, it's easy to get to the point where you are burnt out because you're trying to make sure you're meeting the needs of both sets of students and the, each sets of students, they require different things. So I, I know in my first um, few years of teaching, um, because I was trying to play superwoman and do everything, there were times where I got burned out. So I try my best to be just very mindful of um, not getting to the point of that burnout and, and having that compassion fatigue because we want to um, extend our, our thoughts and our empathy towards our students, but we don't want to get to the point where um, we're so burnt out that we're just pushing them to the side. So I think it's, it's really important that um, we just have a wherewithal of where we're at as educators and saying, okay, this is becoming too much. Let me step back or let me um, look at a different way of approaching this or let me ask for um, help from um, administrators or collaborate with our coworkers to not reach that point. Thank you. Amanda. I agree absolutely with um, everything that Courtney just said. Um, we're all virtual, so the kind of burnout that I'm seeing is almost a helplessness. Um, this is new to us, and if the kids aren't there, we, we do kind of feel helpless. We can't get in touch, you know, with parents or parents who are at work, and so we're missing that support and that presence. Um, but I think it's um, a time now that we're able to focus on what's actually important. I mean, we get to really prioritize, you know, what it is that the students actually need. And we're kind of taking baby steps toward that process here at here in our district. Um, it's taken us kind of some time to get to get to that point. It's almost an entire nine weeks has gone by and we're finally getting through our basic diagnostic testing that we do at the beginning of the year. But I think it's helping us to prioritize what the students needs versus, you know, checking all these boxes, have grades been done, has this been done? We're actually kind of getting to prioritize, even though at times we feel somewhat helpless being alone in the classroom without our kids. Nice, thank you. Um, I want to hear now maybe a little bit what, uh, what Christian, Mark, and Joe are, are hearing in regards to this burnout and compassion fatigue. They're, they have the ear of educators throughout the country. Uh, I think their perspective is a little bit unique on that. And Joe, in particular, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit uh, more on compassion fatigue. I know you've got some, some interesting information on that. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Courtney and Amanda for the work they're doing as educators for our students. I know you're doing double and triple the work. And, and uh, if you don't hear it from anybody else, you've heard it from me, I appreciate you. So yeah, thank you. Uh, so I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate your insight because I think it's so valuable about not wanting to get the burnout and compassion fatigue, you know, compassion fatigue is I, when I'm with a group or presenting to a group, I ask if, if the group of educators is compassionate, they all raise their hand. Are they tired? They all raise their hand. Or they keep giving of themselves anyways, they all raise their hand. So, you know, you're compassionate, you're tired, you keep giving of yourself anyways. That's kind of who we are as educators and why we all, everybody out there listening to this um, podcast or webinar today, uh, signed up to be an educator is, is we give of ourselves, it's a service. And, um, but, I, but I think Courtney, you're so right. If we're not, if we're not careful, we're gonna to get to that burnout stage and we start pushing back. And so, you know, it's okay to be compassionate and keep giving of yourselves, but you wanna take that self-care. Um, so compassion fatigue, though is a part of kind of the natural progression, we don't wanna to get to the point where we're totally burned out. And we're starting to see a lot more teachers today 
Uh, it costs our system billions of dollars a year in teacher burnout, just as Courtney said, where teachers finally say, I can't do it. And we have more and more teachers now with COVID, you know, not coming back. Um, so there's other reasons to be burned out. Uh, our book came out in February of 2020, pre-COVID, on supporting the wounded educator um, on this topic. Um, and we don't have the research on how much more it is for our teachers, um, but we know that more and more are retiring early or finding other professions or because of the demands put on them. Uh, and they're doing it in a very, and I have to say, um, I have uh, two daughters in fourth grade, a daughter in seventh grade, a son who's a freshman in high school and a son in college. And I have to say at all levels, the teachers and the administrators have been amazing through this. Uh, the way they've adjusted uh, has just been uh, inspiring to me uh, in, in a um, time in our history of our country, in our world that we've never walked through. So uh, I give kudos, but I also give, uh, I don't wanna say the warning, but, but the self-care, please take care of yourself so you don't get to burn out because we can't afford to lose more educators. Uh, like Courtney and Amanda, we need you. So, but uh, but thanks for your compassion and, and uh, we appreciate you. Awesome, thanks, Jill. Mark, tell 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 us a little bit about kind of what you're hearing and what your thoughts are on it, and then we'll have Christian wrap up this part. Absolutely, thank you, Jason. And <clears throat> like my friend Joe, I want to thank Courtney and Amanda for being on the webinar, but but mostly for being teachers as well as all the people who have joined us today who are social workers, psychologists, counselors, and teachers. We, I'm old enough to remember back in July, Jason, when we were wondering how long we could keep school open. And um, we've kept school open, but there's been a price. And I think Courtney and Amanda shared that price. That, and it's been really paid by our teachers, quite honestly, that we've been able to bring a normalization of, of sorts to our communities by having school. But let's not confuse that with school as normal as, 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 normal as usual, because it's not business as usual, is it, Amanda or Courtney? It's, um, it's, it's very different. Amanda's, uh, we, we start school very early in the Southeast. Um, and so Amanda and Courtney have been doing this since uh, July and August. And Amanda's, uh, her school system is, is completely virtual. And the price that Amanda pays is, as she mentioned, she has to get her energy from some other place because you don't get to see the kids. And it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge. Courtney's challenge is, is, as we have in many places, she really has two jobs now. She is a full-time face-to-face teacher and she's a full-time virtual teacher. And this is showing up in so many places. Um, Jason, I'll give you one example. I work with a a high school um, that the, the principal called me a week or so ago and said, I, I need your help. We, we, we've got to come up with some relief. He, he works in a rural place and, and Jason, they have a great number of excellent teachers at this place, more than normal distribution would allow. But those teachers are looking for jobs outside of education and they're not mad at the principal. They're not mad at anybody, but here's what they're facing. They have a seven period day in which they teach six face-to-face -face classes. And as they began the school year, they said, well, you know, we'll just pick up the kids who are on our roster and we'll supervise them as they do Edgenuity or Odyssey wear. That was not thought through as we would like because that hasn't played out as neatly as check in on them. Because here's what that's turned into. And, and this is not hyperbole or exaggeration. Those teachers report that they get 150 emails a day. So they're teaching all day. Courtney's like, yep. And then, then they're getting emails. And you can't tell a teacher, it's what, it's what Joe Hendershot said, this is who we are. We don't know stop. It's hard for us to withhold our expertise or our compassion for people. And so those teachers, they're trying to answer all those emails, Jason. And we are at a, a really tough spot right now um, because our teachers are, 
are they're 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 overwhelmed, they're tired, they're they're hanging on there and they're keeping things going. But um, and we're very grateful. But as Joe said, this isn't sustainable and not something we can continue for a very long time. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, I was just this morning I saw an article. It was a 2019 article that said 72% of teachers are dealing with intense stress, and that was before COVID. You know, before 2020. So, you know, you can imagine now. Um, the last couple of days, I've been talking to a couple of different teachers, and what they've been pointing out to me is, you know, a lot of people see what teachers do in the classroom. But I can tell you, if I talk to Amanda and Courtney's administrators and even people in the community there, they would say, you know, Courtney and Amanda do a lot more other things that in answering those 150 emails from a community, like what Mark was talking about, that, that sphere of influence is, is, is way bigger than people realize. I think sometimes people who don't work in education think, well, they just, this is their role, they're teaching, that's the primary thing, but they're really community activists. They impact communities way more than people realize. And then, so you think about it, they're dealing with students, they're dealing with their own family because their families are having st stressors and they're worried about their kids' health and safety. And then, then they, you know, most teachers have high, you know, very social people. They want to make a difference in the community. So they're going to reach, they're going to have lots of friends they're going to be reaching out to. They're going to care about their friends. They're going to care about their neighbors, extended family members, you know, a, a grandmother who they can't see, who's maybe in a difficult situation. That's going to have a huge impact on those teachers, you know, just an extended family member going through a crisis. And I think, um, their ability to volunteer, all these different things they're doing. I'm a, as a social worker, I'm looking at it from a systems thing. A teacher is much more than just a teacher. And I th that's a message I've gotten from quite a few teachers. And I hope what comes out of this, we realize that teachers are really impacting communities way more than we realize. And I think we're starting to see that, you know, one of the things that's shaken out of, out of COVID, that insight on that. Awesome. Thank you. Great, great insight. So, um, given all of that, and I, I appreciate the kind of the foundation that that sets, one of the things I'm curious about, we, we talk like in education as educators about creating um, safe spaces, safe offices, safe classrooms for our students. What, what kind of things can we do right now and what type of support do, do educators need right now um, to help create safe spaces for our educators, for our support staff. And I was wondering, maybe we could just go the, the same order we, we went through. Um, let's hear from Amanda and Courtney, and then let's hear from, from Joe, Mark, and Christian. Um, I have to say, I think our district has done a really great job in uh, allowing the teachers to feel safe. Um, not only do they give us every opportunity for, to work from home if we need to while we're doing virtual education. Um, they're also allowing us to bring our children with us to school if they're fever free, if you know we're wearing masks, they're encouraging us. And I felt like at all, um, at all points, um, like I've been very informed about the decisions that they make. And that's important um, to feel like there's transparency in the decisions that are affecting you know, educators as well as the community. Um, we had input, you know, at the beginning of the year, you know, if our kids um, can come with us, that would help. And lo and behold, our kids were allowed to come, you know, and I just felt like it was important that, that our voices were heard and we were kind of taken care of that way here in our district. Nice, thank you, Courtney. Okay, and just to, just to um, kind of piggyback a little bit off of what Amanda was saying, but just having that, knowing we have that, um, ability to speak um, some of our concerns with our district and knowing that our voices are being heard, um, that creates um, that safe place with us. Unfortunately, well, I'm not gonna say unfortunately because I've enjoyed being back and seeing my um, students, but because we are um, traditional and we are virtual, um, just creating the safe, safe place for us to even be able to step away and just vent some of our frustrations in, in those different moments and times. So just having just that, that mindset or idea of um, if there's something you need to talk about or there's an issue that you're facing that we have the proper people in place that we can go to and kind of share those frustrations. So that, that's kind of what uh, my experience has been 
um, here in our district with having um, our administrators and um, our um, district people um, creating those safe places for us. Awesome, thanks. Let's go, uh, let's go Joe Mark Christian again. Okay, thanks Jason. Well, I would say, you know, first of all, I started hanging out with counselors uh, and school psychologists to, to learn some of this stuff. And, and Jason and, and Christian, you could probably agree with me, or disagree with me if you want. Uh, but the thing I like about safe place is counselors have taught me that healing takes place in safe place. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So, so healing takes place in safe place. So we want to create safe space for our students and our teachers and our administrative teams and our support staff. Because that's what, even though we're not healing, we can create safe place, which is where that takes place. And we have to, first of all, you know, we talk about listening to our teachers, which is, which is so critical and listening to each other, which is critical. But then you got to get to the level of understanding. And that's the next level. And people say, well, I listen and I understand. That's still good. And we want to do that. But there's a next step. There's a next layer that you have to then appreciate where that person is coming from. So whether that's your teacher, your school principal, your school superintendent, your support staff, your bus driver, whatever, you have to listen, understand, and then that last step of appreciating where they're coming from, to appreciate that these teachers are putting in uh, two and three shifts, the, the bus drivers are, are, are putting themselves at risk, you know, when they don't have to, you know. So again, it's listening, understanding, and appreciating. And then understanding that also that we're all either in emotional survival or critical thinking. And when we're talking about coming into what we feel is sometimes as an unsafe place, because we're unsure of what COVID brings to the table or whatever else is going on in our country, um, you know, we're talking about getting people from emotional to survival to critically thinking. And the good news, and this is good news that I've heard lately, is that a lot of the principals, a lot of the teachers I've heard have talked about how pleased they've been with the students coming in and following the mask rules and the space. And, and so they're getting kids from the emotional to the survival, to the critical thinking spot on how important it is to, to follow the steps for safety. And again, if we follow these steps, you know, to get to the critical thinking, to stay safe, then we're gonna get to the healing part. Create, I guess in, in essence, we wanna create safe space for healing for everybody. And I think that's such a critical, critical piece. So that was a lot packed into there uh, about safe space. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. One of the things I've been working with administrators on, Jason, um, that are strategies for them to support teachers, uh, a couple of things. One, back into the notion of safe space, sometimes that space is, uh, is in the form of the chart paper ministry, where you put up a, uh, a, a question of the week and give people sticky notes and give them a chance to, to share. And, and Amanda's... Um, environment now that would probably have to be do, done on a Google form instead, but um, because they're all virtual, but uh, also giving, and I think you can do this in a Zoom or, or in another format, um, I had a principal I worked with last year who wanted to reach out to his teachers, so he created popcorn with the principal every Tuesday and Thursday, and it was not mandated, there was no agenda, people just came in and talked, and creating that place for people to be able to talk to each other as humans and be able to share those thoughts with the administration, that has been very helpful in the past, but it's also helpful now, right? Into giving uh, teachers a place to share. I, my advice to, to administrators has been to listen, number one, and the second is to give the gift of time. And I've encouraged administrators, this may be blasphemous in some school systems, and I regret that that could be true, but instead of spending 45 minutes doing an observation and a write-up, I'd rather that principal go in and say, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a positive rating, Courtney. I have 40 minutes left. What can I do for you? I think those are the two pieces that I have, I believe that teachers, they want to, they want someone to listen and they want the gift of time. Thank you. Christian. And, uh, um, you know, last 22 years, you know, why try? We've 
really gone into, you know, we've gone into over 30,000 schools emphasizing the mental health needs and the social and emotional needs of students. I mean, to the extreme, I mean, that's, as a social worker, I just, you know, 20 years ago, I said, okay, I'm going to really focus on making sure kids have these tools to bounce back, to thrive. And just a couple of days ago, I was speaking to a couple hundred students in a school district on resilience, so teaching these skills to the kids and the teachers. Afterwards, I got a response from a whole bunch of teachers saying, look, Christian, we need these skills just as much. Our mental health and our resilience needs to really be looked at. And I can tell you why try, me personally, and I, Jason could probably speak to this, even spends more time with teachers than me, but but we know why try we going forward that we got to repent a little bit over the next, you know, next 20 years, we're going to really be speaking out about the mental health needs of administrators, teachers, and, and really putting an emphasis there. And I'd love to, you know, maybe, you know, Courtney or Amanda can tell me if we're crazy or not, but I'm just, it, sometimes I'm being sensitive. Sometimes with mental health with adults, we think we should not intervene. The adult has their own decision to make about mental health. We shouldn't intervene too much as a social worker, as a child advocate, it's easy for me to focus on that, but we're, we're realizing again at why try and we're and for me i would be really kind of vulnerable or honest the fact that teachers are now knocking down my door and saying christian come on we need these mental health skills just as much so i know that's a little bit of a repentance process there here at why try we're going to make some changes there but um, i don't know if jason you want to speak to that you you probably have a little more insight on that than me but we know that's a need at why try what are your feelings on that jason yeah, I, I agree. I, I appreciate the question. I, I think in the back of our mind, we've always thought we'll go in and we'll, we'll teach, we'll instruct teachers on how to administer this intervention or this curriculum to their kids. And in the back of my mind, I think we've always thought that they would kind of capture some of these ideas through osmosis uh, that would kind of creep in and, and impact their own lives as well. And I think where we really have to be, I think, more um, intentional right now is really focusing with some intentionality on um, taking care of our our staff uh, on us as the grown ups not at the expense of the of the kids but but we need because every I think Joe articulated it really well everybody that gets into education has this natural um, desire to put the kids in front of themselves that that's just a thing that we do. And, you know, right now, I think we're seeing what happens when our emotional resources start to become depleted. We have to be able to, um, we have to be able to keep those, those uh, replenished. And so we, we got to take care. So I, I agree, Christian. Um, it actually takes me to one of the, the next questions that I wanted to, to bring up. Um, we'll, we'll come back to students in a minute, but I'm, I'm still, I'm thinking about this concept of taking care of our, our educators. And it's fascinating to me, even hearing like what's important when, uh, when Courtney and Amanda are talking about the importance of being heard as an educator, I'm thinking of the concept we believe in of voice and choice for the kids. Well, voice and choice for our educators is probably just as important. And another thing that maybe has kind of dual, dual meaning, we, we are trying to help kids thrive as students. And I think that concept probably is just as applicable to our teaching and, uh, and educator staff as well. So I, I was curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, um, kind of a two-part question. One, what do you think it means? Like, if I say, what does it mean to thrive as an educator? What does that mean to you? And then right now, given all of the uh, challenges we're dealing with, what do you think educators need right now, or what are some strategies that can help educators attempt to thrive amidst all the adversity we're facing right now? And I kind of like the order we're going in. Let's stick with it for a minute. Maybe we can go Courtney and then Amanda, and then we'll go Joe, Mark, and Christian again. Okay, so when I think about, um, you know, educators being able to thrive, um, some of the first things that come to my mind are, are being able to develop those meaningful, meaningful relationships um, with our students, because at the end of the day, that's who we are here for. We're here for our students. So developing those um, meaning, meaningful relationships um, and then just having a desire to be successful. I, I, I can speak personally, my desire um, for, for being successful as an educator helps me to be, be able to thrive as an educator. Um, I think about my heart posture, like this is my passion. Ed education is my, me, me seeing students 
um, get to where they need to be and having those um, various aha moments. That is my why, that is my, my reason. That, that's what I thrive off of. Um, and then seeking and asking for help. Um, educators are able to thrive when they have the ability to um, be able to seek out and ask for help. Um, Mark said something a little bit earlier about um, just knowing that we are being heard and that kind of leads into um, what do we need from administrators or uh, when we think about having that support and just being in a position where um, you're not just being heard, but you're actually being listened to. So any plight that you may have that your um, administrators are listening to those different things and then there's a follow up or a follow through with whatever grievance that you have. And then I also think that it's important for um, our administrators to have developed emotional skills. Because if we are presenting um, an issue um, to an administrator, if their emotional skills aren't developed, then in turn, they can't really help us to be able to process some of the things that you know, we're dealing with as educators so that we can take that back and then work through those things then to be able to you know, be there and do what we need to do for our students. Thank you. Amanda. I absolutely love your first statement, Courtney, about uh, relationships being the sign of, 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 a, of an educator thriving. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, I believe an educator thrives when they affect change, be it in their students and with themselves and in their own personal lives as well. Anytime, um, and, and I think that change comes when you're able to dedicate the amount of time that is necessary for that change to occur. Um, I know that I'm thriving as an educator when I'm not drowning all weekend and at the end of every week in grading papers and parent contacts, when I'm able to manage my time you know, wisely and, and able to make time for myself, to make time to, to, to maintain um, physical and emotional health. Uh, by myself, I practice yoga daily. And when I can balance all of those areas in my life, I feel like that's what helps me to thrive. And, and just time management helps, is, is a sign of, of thriving. Awesome. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's throw it over. Let's mix up the order on this one just a little bit. Let's go. Let's hear from Christian, Mark, and then Joe. All right. Now, I love, Courtney, what you said about knowing that why. When you know that why, it helps you thrive and um, especially when you see your students progressing that has a huge huge impact I don't have too much to say here because you guys kind of summed it up I, I do want to emphasize I, I know there's a lot of school social workers counselors mental health people out there listening too but one thing I, I want to kind of maybe a shout out to mental health even paraprofessionals and stuff is that you know a lot of teachers I'm talking to what makes it difficult for them to thrive is when they see students with tremendous high needs and those students take up a ton of their you know, time and focus, and that's important to help those students. But I'm hoping that um, school social workers, school psychologists, we can reach out, do some intervention with some of these kids, especially right now with what's going on. And so the teachers are in a place, because you know, what teachers are incredible at is being able to teach and, and reach you know, a wide variety of students in their classroom with different needs. But I also think, I'll kind of call, call, call it to my profession of mental health, we need to provide more supports to you guys so that you do what you do really well. And I think sometimes the communication between mental health and the educators could be improved in reaching some of those kids. The, I know in so many places, they're like, oh, I didn't realize I could get the school social worker to do that or the mental health people to do that. So anyways, I just wanna plant that seed. And I think all those things help each other thrive, but we gotta get these, these supports to, to these teachers. Thanks, Mark. Jason, uh, we, we heard from Jeanette Fondness and from Karen Hames in the chat, and they talked about doing uh, a Google form or an app to check on people every day. I think that's a critical thing is to acknowledge, right? I mean, the stress that our teachers are under, that's a step in the right direction. As we were talking earlier, the whole idea of listening, the whole idea of giving time. Look, I'm a big fan of the woot woot wagon. I, I like the idea of driving it around the school and giving out treats and uh, principals are talking with me frequently about what are some ideas to do that, you know, um, have a brownie, don't, don't frownie, have a brownie, you know, all kinds of different things of that sort. And, and I always think those things matter. 
um, for, for morale. But I, but I certainly think now it's a little deeper than, than normal um, where we need, as, as Courtney was talking about, we, teachers don't need you to pretend you're listening. They really need for you to listen. Even if you can't solve their problems, they, they need that but they do need a little problem solving as well, some uh, adaptations. And, I, and I, I was hearing from a couple of people on the chat, um, Jerry Lynn Phillips, about how do you, if you're a counselor, how do you nudge administration to take this seriously? I throw out the idea of get a survey and find out what percentage of your people uh, are, are stressed on a scale of one to five, because if people can't hear with their heart, maybe they can hear with their head. And, they can see that data. I think those help us. Honestly, there's some administrative decisions that need to be made as we move forward through this that can really relieve uh, a little bit of the stress and help our teachers be better teachers. Awesome. Hey, Thank you. Jason, we, hey, Jason, before we move on, can I just throw out one more thing? Yeah. On this, relates to helping teachers thrive. Again, this is the, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a social activist, so I got to, um, emphasize something. T today I read a couple articles that were showing that a lot of um, school districts now are starting to give a COVID bonus to teachers. I think teachers need a, a little bit of economic boost to help them thrive right now with what's going on. And the teachers, the feedback that these school districts are doing that have given these bonuses, they've been one, two percent, you know, COVID bonuses for you know the next month has made a huge difference, they're saying, to the teachers' morales and communication, everything. So um, I think sometimes we should not overlook the economics of helping teachers thrive. I'm sorry, I probably should be on my soapbox here, but um, I was so excited to see today that districts are starting to do that. And I'm, I'm awesome. encouraged. I, I, I'm, confident, I'm confident there's not one person that's tuned in right now that will disagree with you. <laughs> Great. It's a, it's a, I, I think it's a, a really important discussion, though, that, that hopefully districts are willing to have. Uh, Joe, let's hear from you. Um, well, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off what um, Mark said. Um, if you're looking for a survey, I have a 21-question survey on this topic of wounded students and compassion fatigue and burnout on a 1 to 7 Likert scale. If you go to Hope for the Wounded, it's on our homepage. Put in your email, free of charge. You can use it. You can download it, send it out to your staff, pie graph it, go back, get the information you need, totally free of charge. So if you're looking for something uh, to help measure where your staff's currently at on the topic of compassion fatigue and burnout and woundedness uh, with students and your teachers, feel free to go to our website, hopeforthewounded.org. And that's uh, for the number four, right? Hope for... Yeah for the wounded.org. I'll type and that into the chat tool. It's right. It's the very first thing you'll see is free survey. It's my doctoral dissertation survey. And I give that out free of charge so school districts can, can use that as measure. So Mark, thanks for bringing that up because we want to put tools in people's hands here today. Um, wow, I, I don't know how it is to follow all this up. All, all I can say is, you know, it goes back again to you know, that listening, that understanding, but I can't emphasize enough. You can listen and you can understand, but if you don't appreciate where our educators are coming from, you know, and it's, it's just difficult to make that connection um, where, where they're currently at. Um, I have my four oldest children, I have nine children, my four oldest children are teachers. So I'm on top of this every day. They teach special education, they teach fourth grade, uh, I teach middle school, so I'm kind of getting, and then of course I got all my kids in all the different grade levels, so I'm kind of tuned into this every day and hearing the work that everybody's putting in to do all this. Um, but, you know, I think really what it boils down to is just understanding kind of what John Steinbeck once said, to have three teachers in a lifetime that make the difference is the best of luck. And, you know, and I, I, I've, I've had the best of luck. I've had three wonderful teachers like Amanda Courtney that stepped into my life that made a difference in the best of times. Um, and, and think of how many of our kids, you know, uh, the research since 2006, I've been speaking on wounded students. And since 2006, people have been coming up to me after speaking on wounded students and saying, what about the wounded educator? What about the wounded educator? 
And it took me a long time to process it. And I started thinking about my own career, my kid's career and all that. And I started thinking, yeah, we're dealing with our own stuff. And so we went ahead and published uh, the book this year, uh, Supporting the Wounded Educator. Uh, again, that was pre-COVID, but, but the research says 47.9% of kids pre-COVID were dealing with wounds. Then it was up around there, it was changing to around 60%. Now, how many more kids are coming back to school wounded or at home wounded? And how much more pressure does that put on our teachers to deal with more kids dealing with trauma and have more stress to deal with behaviors, um, plus dealing with their own stress on top of it? So I think our what we can do as uh, professional uh, administrators, uh, parents, uh, community members, whoever that, to, to, to look, to reach out to our educators and look, look at, look at it in an empathic way, to put ourselves in their shoes, you know, um, and to feel what they're feeling. And, and I have to say, I, I'll, I'll kind of close with this one. You know, I've seen some amazing things. I've said it already. I had a teacher just call my son, who's a, who's a freshman this year, and said, you know, we're doing 100% virtual. And he said, hey, is your son at home? And I said, sure. And, he, and I, I thought he was going to talk about his assignment he's missing or something. And, and he says, hey, Katayo, my son's name is Katayo. He says, Katayo, this is your teacher. Uh, I just want to let you know that I miss you. I care for you. And I love you. You, you just need to know that. I just miss you. And my son just stood there. I mean, just his tears started welling up in his eyes. That's the power that we have, even virtually with our students, you know? So I just think it's such an important thing to, to keep our perspective consciousness going, to really be empathetic with our, our educators out there, that the amazing impact they're having, even under, under the most difficult circumstances. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I put your website in the, the chat tool. I hope everybody caught that. Um, really, really uh, appreciate that. Generous of you to, to, to give that out to people. It's uh, basically an emotional check-in for, for educators, right, Joe, that they can get if they'll go to that website? Yeah, they can do it individually. They have my total permission to Google Doc it, send it out to their entire district, get it back, pie graph it, chart it, do whatever, and give them the information. Uh, there's absolutely no charge. Just give us your web, just give us your email address, get it, and it'll shoot right to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I want to get to, we've got a, a little bit of time left, and I, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this next one. Uh, another kind of a, a two-part question. I want to get into some practical strategies. People are always really hungry for those. So I was curious if, if any of you could share some practical strategies right now that you're using or that you've seen that can help educators um, in some cases maybe just survive, but hopefully ultimately thrive. And then also um, feel free, because I think they are connected, feel free to talk a little bit about what, our, uh, what you think our students need right now. Um, you know, what we can do to, to not just help ourselves thrive, but also support our students and what they need. And let's kind of go with that, that same order. Let's go Courtney, Amanda, and then we'll, we'll throw it over to the, the gentleman. Um, just speaking from personal experience, <laughs> what has helped me this year, um, some practical strategies is just collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. So just having that partner, that go-to person that you guys can sit down and brainstorm because when, um, like in my case, having to do full-time virtual, full-time traditional, that can be a lot of work, but having the, um, you know, people or other educators in place that you can collaborate with and brainstorm with and share ideas with, I think that has been um, a, a very key point um, for me this year. Um, we've already talked about some of the, um, some of the pointers that I already kind of jotted down about the practical things that we we don't think about. We think about this big overlying, oh, I need to do this, but something as simple as, and I think um, um, Amanda said it earlier, but it's just practicing self-care. 
Um, when we think strategies, we automatically think, what can I do within, this, within my classroom? What can I do within the school? But practicing that self-care uh, will trickle over into the classroom and into the school because then you're presenting your best self. Um, and then one of the things that just kept coming to me um, with practical strategies is just allowing yourself to have grace giving yourself grace and then requiring that same grace from other people and just understanding as an educator, although we want to save the world, we want to save our children, um, we have to just remind ourselves daily that we are human. And if we make a mistake, we just have to dust ourselves off and wipe our slate clean and know that the next day is a, a new start um, and that we just start fresh the next day and, and, and go in it with that mindset. And then as far as the students, just thinking about um, some of the biggest challenges for students that I've seen is just uh, a lot of my students just have that sense of apathy. Um, they don't see um, in the long run of things. They, they, they need something tangible. They need the, the now. This is what I need right now. So because they don't have that instant gratification, it, it, a lot of the times they blow off um, or they're not as engaged or they're not as committed to um, the value of their education because they need that instant gratification. And unfortunately, um, that's just the kind of the, the society that we live in today with all of the technology and the, the different things that are presented to the youth now versus when I was younger. Um, and, and just a way that I have just tried to combat that with my students is just encouraging them to, okay, let's work towards just accomplishing smaller goals that will then lead up to your, your bigger goals so that that sense of apathy doesn't set in and then it's hard to kind of dig our students um, out of that. Awesome, thank you, Amanda. I, I, I agree with the grace, um, Courtney, so much. That, that happens to be my practical advice this year is that I think we, we really have to let go of how it used to be, how we used to do things and um, how perfect it had to be that this, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that uncertainty is all around us and it's just time to embrace it and know that it begets resiliency and strength and that you know, when we overcome these challenges, we're, we're better off for it. And we can kind of t take a step back and, and focus on, on our priorities at this point when we don't get quite so caught up in how it used to be, what it needs to be and our perception of um, what it means to be a perfect teacher and, or a parent and, or a student and have perfect grades. You know, that's not the priority anymore. We're, as we step back and say, okay, this is a year that everything has changed. It's time to prioritize what's really important this year and understand that growing through these changes is, is going to make us more resilient as teachers and students. Thank you. Let's go uh, Mark, Christian, then Joe. Thanks, Jason. Two things real quickly. Um, Amy DeBrienzia and uh, Julie Moser in the chat both talked about how hybrid is really challenging. Amy talked about how watching her teachers struggle, um, she can listen, but she doesn't always know what to offer besides ear and heart. I think to a great degree, Amy, that's part of what we can offer this year. That's a strategy uh, to offer our ear, to offer our heart to our colleagues. One thing I would offer to you is if we can create a format for that. Um, I've been working with the elementary school for the last three years and we've developed a home base. The kids end the day at the same place they begin the day. And in a classroom of 24, right, we divide it into six groups of four. Those four become a family group. It's not brand new. We use it in churches all the time. But that family group of students, they're able to support each other and they end every day at this school with the question, what did I learn? Um, what is my big question today? And what do I need to do tomorrow to, to be my best? Those three things, that four, those four kids in that group have been talking about that every day for the last three years. As hard times come, and, and Amy, I, I, I look at what you said and, and it touches my heart because I think 
your experiences you described is what we have so so broadly spread across the the country right now sometimes when you're going through hell you have to keep going and i think that's a lot of christians work is is that power of resiliency but i think we can gain that power in partnerships as courtney said through collaboration i just encourage us what if we can organize that in such a way where it allows everyone not just those who happen to be fortunate enough to be next to Amy and Julie in their, their school, but what if we organize our teachers in those same family groups that can support each other? Together, we, we divide the troubles and multiply the joy. I wonder if, if, if four-person family groups might be a really big part of how we can support each other through this year. Awesome idea. Christian. Wow. I mean, these are all incredible. I feel like I'm in a resilience workshop, man. I, I want to hire everybody there to come help me get this message of resilience out to the world. That's, that's awesome. Um, my son came home the other day and just blew me out of the water. He told me a story, picked him up in front of school and he jumps in the car and tells me the story that his teacher that day um, got them working on an assignment. He was going through a difficult time let the students know he was having a difficult time. He had a migraine headache. And then he went under his desk and went to sleep <laughs> under his desk. And, and then he woke back up, you know, in the class. I don't know if he's sound asleep, but he's probably just trying to close his eyes for a minute. But he was authentic with the students. He was vulnerable. And the students are feeling the same vulnerability. And they, and I can tell you, my son loves that teacher. When that teacher teaches the rest of this year, his words is everything he does when he's doing the academics is going to be 10 times more powerful because he was real with those students. And we, in, just him being vulnerable, we, in why try we teach something called surrendering the one-up relationship. We want to create an environment where people don't feel one down in relationship there. If a child knows they have value and worth, whether they succeed or whether they fail, they're much more likely to engage and, and stuff. Anyway, so this incredible teacher was vulnerable. And I was talking to my son about, you know, it's, it's as normal as breathing to have negative emotions, to feel sad, hurt, angry, fearful. That is, that's part of the human condition. It's actually what makes us human. We wouldn't, we'd be a robot, we'd be machine, we'd be artificial intelligence if we didn't have these positive and negative emotions. And one of my favorite quotes is, there's no law in the universe that says you cannot take a negative emotion and create a productive outcome with it. And that's what this teacher did, you know, by being vulnerable, my son's teacher. And, um, you know, I love, you know, what you both were saying, Amanda, and Courtney, about that grace, that self-grace. The last chapter in, in my book, The Resilience Breakthrough, is on self-grace. And we, the kryptonite of being able to bounce back, if we don't forgive ourselves when we're not perfect, when we make a mistake, we have no desire to be resilient. We have no desire to bounce back. So we have to forgive ourselves or our resilience goes down really, really, really quick. And I, I think that's so important. The other thing I want to emphasize is, um, is that this is temporary. I was talking to my buddy the other day. I was telling him all my problems. I was like, man, I'm dealing with this, 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 this. And I was just kind of letting loose on him a little bit. And he said, you do realize, Christian, 100 years from now, it will be all new people. Relax, man. Keep this in perspective. And I was like, whoa. It just like hit me over the head really hard with it. It was like the greatest um, two-second intervention I've ever had because it's all new people. So all this stuff is temporary. Um, so even with the, in the, to realize like, you know, whether that's six months from now or a year from now, and I, I, now let me be very clear. I hope we learn some things and we don't go back to how things were, you know, per se that we, that we, the debate is over whether relationships are the biggest X factor. We're seeing what's happening with the elderly and children when they do not have social connection. So, you know, I've spent the last you know, almost 22 years screaming about the importance of relationships and I'd get arguments and debate. That bait, debate is done. I cannot get, wait to get back out there in a world that understands that the greatest X factor is, is something called relational resilience, where you go through the motions, you don't give up because another person needs you and you need them. You know, my goal is that every educator in this country has access to where internal motivation comes from. I think, you know, I, I end a lot of my speeches when I'm advocating for, for students is that's a social justice issue. Some people 
have access to evidence-based resilience and many people don't. And, and you know, why try we teach those four sources of resilience? And that's that relational resilience I just spoke about, you know, if I never got invited to speak again, I would literally go do whatever I need. I'd go get three other jobs to support my kids because that, that's that interdependence. Um, human beings, we know we're motivated by other human beings. And then there's something called street resilience where you take disrespect or past mistakes and use it as fuel for, to propel you forward. And human beings, we are always, there's always gonna be someone disrespecting you. And the ability to use that disrespect as a fuel source gives you a powerful, powerful advantage. And then there's resource resilience, just maximizing our talents, our abilities, the resources around us. And teachers do an incredible job doing that. And then there's rock bottom resilience. And one of the most important things, everybody has their own personal rock bottom. And when you're rock bottom, if you have the ability to say to yourself, how do I use this suffering? How do I use this pain as my best friend? That's kind of the gateway. That's the door to being resilient and, and bouncing back. And, and I know I don't have enough time to go into depth on these, but um, you know, that's our goal is we, we really wanna make sure teachers have access to this. Um, if I, I just yesterday did a podcast with Roberto Rivera, who's an incredible national advocate. If you go to our website, whytry.org, you can access, we have a resilience podcast that talks about a lot of these things. We just, the current one is Aaron Gruel is on the podcast that I interviewed that, that um, from Freedom Writer. So please, any teachers out there, if you want to keep everything we're talking about today, you want to keep that going. We have all of our webinars on the website. We have the podcast, the Resilience Breakthrough podcast and then we have a parenting guide to teach resilience to families that you can get off the website so please check that out at, at ytribe.org and i just want to thank this panel this is an incredible panel i know mark as i've learned about his work helping teachers impacting the education system i understand why he was the you know principal of the year it's been amazing to hear from you know both of you guys amanda and courtney and joe's been my hero for years and um well i'm the fierce jason puts all this where the rubber hits the road. Jason, I'm the hot air, Jason's the real deal. He makes sure that teachers and families get access to this, um, this information. So anyways, you guys are all my heroes and, but we gotta give ourselves grace. We gotta keep giving ourselves grace and that, that's, that grace is the X factor right now. And don't worry, things are not going to stay the same. I think we're gonna see a lot of change here in the next few months. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just for everybody that's asking, we'll put up a slide here at the end with contact information for everybody, email addresses, websites. Joe, give us some thoughts. Love to hear from you about, uh, about that, that last uh, question we talked about, practical strategies, any ideas you have? Well, I'm gonna piggyback off at what everybody else and Courtney started with is grace. And in Webster's Online Dictionary, I've said it before, it's in, a, in, in all our schools, Webster's Online Dictionary is, is grace, and I'm gonna add the term mercy, and it's called a temporary exemption and a compassionate treatment. And we got to give all ourselves a temporary exemption and a compassionate treatment. And how many of us in our life have needed that? I know I've needed that several times and will probably need it again before I'm through. So, uh, Courtney, thank you for bringing that up because I think that's so huge for all of us. And, you know, I think it all boils down to hope. You know, hope is at the centerpiece of all this. And hope is the definition of hope is, is a belief possible. You know, something good is possible. And something good is possible through all this. Whether it's gonna make us a more empathic society, I think that's possible. You know, Mother Teresa once said, and I paraphrase Mother Teresa, uh, the also society is based on the fact that we've become indifferent to the needs of our brothers and sisters. We can no longer be indifferent to the needs of our brothers and sisters because we're all under the same struggle with, with, with COVID and things we're dealing with you know, that we can no longer be indifferent. And we have to be a more empathic culture, a more empathic society. Um, empathy, you know, is the ability to step in someone else's shoes and to feel what they're feeling. And if we listen to our kids today, and one day I, I did my doctoral research on, on empathy, uh, my dissertation, and I had all these definitions and I, and I really went and thought about all the hundreds, if not thousands of kids I talked with in their jail cells in my career and they would always close by saying this to me when they would tell me their story. They would say, they would say, do you feel me? Do you feel me? And the, I thought the definition of empathy is to feel what someone else feels. So what the kids are saying today is, can I have your empathy? 
So I think with what our kids are dealing with today is they really need our empathy even more because they're, they're socially isolated from their friends. They're dealing with some uncertainties that they're having a hard time processing. And, and so when they say, do you feel me? We have to know that they're, they're asking for our empathy. And there, you know, you ask for some strategies some some things our teachers can do. Our, our book has several in there. I'll just give a couple real quick. Journal, uh, unplug. I'm really paying attention to unplugging during my phone during the day. Uh, uh, journaling. I'm just picking up a couple of quick things that I do. Uh, when this is over, my wife's upstairs doing a, a podcast, as I said right now, in San Antonio. We are taking a walk. We are taking a long walk. We just have it scheduled, you know, it's so it's learning this, when to say yes and when to say no, um, you know, all those types of things. When learn to laugh and, and, and I think choosing our words wisely is important because I think as I go around the country, so many people say to me, well, Joe, I can, I can do some work, but I'm just a teacher. You know, I'm just a teacher. And I say that is the biggest influence in a child's life next to a parent. That is a huge responsibility that we have. And in the absence of some parents, that makes us number, number one. So I appreciate, I honor all our educators, our superintendents, our principals, our support staff, our, our, our educators, the extra time that they're putting into my, pouring into my children's lives. I really appreciate their empathy, their grace, their mercy they're given towards my kids. And, and again, the hope that they're instilling into my children every day that something good is just about to happen. And I just, those are my closing comments today. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So what I wanna do, let's close out on this. This is my favorite question to ask somebody right now. It's totally selfish because I need to hear the answer, but I think it's helpful for everybody to hear. I just wanna know in two minutes or less, what is giving you hope right now? What is it that's giving you hope right now? And let's just go right down. Let's go Courtney, Amanda, Joe, Mark, Christian. Courtney, go. What's giving you hope right now? Um, what's giving me hope right now is watching my students and my colleagues and even myself come in and do it every day. So coming in and giving it our all every single day, that's giving me hope because I know the end result is we're making it through another day, through another week, through another month, we'll make it through this year. We're gonna come out on the other side even better than what we went into this, um, thinking about COVID and everything else that's going on around the world. So just seeing everyone give it their all every single day and laying it all out on the table, that is giving me hope. Thank you, thank you. Amanda. Uh, my reading students are giving me hope. Um, I've have the privilege of watching their recorded videos as they practice their fluency task. And I get to hear that no matter what's going on in their house, there's music, there's siblings. And I've got students that are, you know, making away from themselves in their closet and reading grade level passages, despite the fact that they are three and four grade levels behind on diagnostic testing. And they just give me such hope and they teach me every day. I love it. Thank you, Joe. Um, you know, I already spoke on hope a little bit. Something good's about to happen. Something good is happening every day in my kids' lives when their teachers are speaking words of truth, not false beliefs into their life. Um, you know, I, I think it's so true today that, that our kids are living with these false beliefs. And when I see teachers pour the truth into my children's life, that, that they can not just accomplish things, you know, in school, but outside of school, and they're supporting them socially, emotionally, and academically. They're, they're hitting all the markers in a very difficult time in our history. They're hitting the social, the emotional, and the academics. And that's given me hope that we're not just focused on one thing, that we're looking at the whole child. And I can see all the teachers that, that are working with my children do that every day. And I am so grateful and, uh, and, and as well as, like I said, the support of the administrators and, and the support staff. So that's what's given me hope is, is the teachers who get up every day and I, I, I see them working with my kids. I love awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, what's given you hope? And while you're talking, 
If our attendees blow up the chat tool, feel free to type in the chat box what's giving you hope right now as well, because I love to hear that. But while they're typing, Mark, tell us what's giving you hope right now. Humans are interesting, Jason. <laughs> when we're at our worst, where things are at their worst, that's actually when we're at our best. When people feel helpless, they're more likely to help. And when people have been apart, they can see how important it is to be a part. That gives me hope. Thank you. Christian. Yeah, the sacrifice the teachers are making and educators are making just to keep education going, that it, it, it's not slowing down, gives me tremendous hope. You know, education we know is the backbone of our society. It's literally the backbone of human progress. So if we wanna do something to lower hate in this country, it's gonna be through education. If we're gonna do something about racism, it's gonna be through education. If we're gonna do something about crime, if we're gonna do something about lowering poverty, education is the backbone of these social ills that we're seeing and to understand how we should treat other human beings why we should treat human beings with dignity and respect it's all through education so most human progress is going to come through education this is why this is the most important work on the planet and the teachers are the backbone in making that happen and they are not shutting down they're stepping it up and that's what's going to change this world and it's it change does not come without exposure to incredible ideas, to, to principles and, and things that literally help us see how humans can progress. It's all through education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna try not to cry reading the comments here you talk about hearing students laugh from behind their mask, having a student wave at you from a distance is what's giving you hope. It's doing the same thing for me. And honestly, my opportunity to um, affiliate with all of you with this incredible family of educators and therapists and counselors throughout the country that I'm so grateful to feel a part of um, gives me hope. You, you all are the greatest people in the world. Thanks for doing what you're doing. I hope that, uh, that you felt what we've discussed today. Huge thank you, huge virtual round of applause to our panelists for bringing these great ideas. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to all our attendees. Uh, we love you. All the best in, uh, in what you're doing as you continue to, to bravely teach, educate, and counsel in this incredibly difficult year. Keep up the good work. I'm going to put up a slide with our contact information and feel free to reach out to us. We've got some great resources available um, here for you as well as um, we just love to hear from you. So let me put that up and... That's all we've got. Thank you, everybody, for another wonderful webinar. All the best. Panelists, you can stay on if you'd like, and, uh, and feel free to linger.